Here's a sample of what you'll hear on this episode of Natural Health Matters. It's amazing to see people with chronic health issues um, as you start to remove you know, inflammatory foods, fix nutritional deficiencies, remove environmental exposures, address their gut, address their sleeping patterns, how quickly people begin to heal. It's almost like they want to heal. You just got to give them the right stuff. I think there's a saying in actually naturopathic medicine, remove the things that don't belong and put in the things that do belong and your body does the rest, right? Welcome to the Natural Health Matters podcast, where it's all about maximizing your health potential so that you can pursue the abundant life more effectively. I'm your host, David Sandstrom, naturopathic doctor and biblical health coach, and this is episode number 49. This episode is brought to you by my book, The Christian's Guide to Holistic Health. Getting educated on natural and holistic health is time-consuming and can be expensive, not to mention overwhelming. I want to help you with that. My book will put you on the fast track to the vibrant health and vitality you've been looking for. If you'd like to avoid overwhelm and get some biblically-based holistic health information that you can implement right away, go to my website, davidshadstrom.com forward slash book. You can learn more and pick up a copy today. If that doesn't work, you can go directly to Amazon. It's available there in paperback, Kindle, and Audible. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Aaron Hartman. He's the president of the Richmond Functional Medicine Clinic, and he oversees 10 practitioners in Richmond, Virginia. He's super knowledgeable, and he's got a ton of information to share in this episode. He does a great job of articulating exactly what functional medicine really looks like. And he's also very much involved in the research going on with the COVID-19 vaccines, the various ones. And today there's a lot of conversation going on about the vaccines, and he's right there in the middle of all the research. So I encourage you to hang into the end and listen to what he has to say. It's very interesting. So let's jump right into my conversation with Dr. Aaron Hartman. Today we have on the show Dr. Aaron Hartman. Dr. Aaron is a board-certified family practice medicine practitioner, a clinical researcher, and a functional medicine practitioner. After years in family practice, he felt called to make a dramatic shift and began to pursue functional medicine for his own family's health. Soon, Dr. Hartman recognized the benefits of functional medicine for anyone who has suffered unnecessarily from a system that fails to support whole person health. Dr. Hartman, welcome to Natural Health Matters. David, thanks thanks for having me here. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, It's my pleasure. So I'm always glad to have somebody like yourself on the show when you're trained in the traditional medical fashion and you understand the the strengths and the weaknesses of that medical model. And you kind of branch out and instead of just being a medical student, you become a student of medicine. And now you do a lot of functional work. So I'd like for you to talk to a little bit about what the difference is between traditional medicine and functional medicine, if you could. Well, the traditional medical model is a disease-focused approach. Um, first and foremost, it looks at, you know, you come in with a diabetes, blood pressure, cholesterol. It's, fi- it's primarily focused on the, the one or two issues at hand. You have a heart attack, whatnot. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing, it's, it's, it's focused on episodes of care, you know, these visits and acuity. It's, it's mainly acute care medicine. And that's the model that developed, you know, when we had infectious diseases were the most common cause of death in our country. Um, when antibiotics changed everything, when vaccines changed everything, this idea of acute care, you have an appendicitis, um, surgical procedures were going on, you know, you know, ancient Egypt, they were doing, you know, surgical brains procedures, you know, and what, and that's been the model going up. But the problem is, is science has changed, but the model of delivery of care hasn't changed. You know, the model where currently the way where healthcare is currently delivered is the same healthcare model that my grandparents got. You go to the doctor's office, pay him some money, insurance pays him money. I'm sick. They give me a prescription and I go my way. Um, functional medicine is more, it's more chronic care focused. And it's, it's a more broad thing looking at root calls. You know, you come with diabetes, not what are the, the FDA approved medications I can give you based on your A1C being seven, which is a, is a sugar level. But why do you have this diabetes? How severe is it? What other things are causing your diabetes? What are other leverage points? You know, diet, lifestyle, exercise, sleep, nutritional things environmental toxins, heavy metals, you know, the building you live in, the culture you're from, that all these things can play into your diabetes. And so what functional medicine does, is it goes to the root of whatever's going on, but it's also chronic care medicine, not just a treating the acute issue, but all the other underlying things that can lead up to um, whatever is coming before. So it's the phrase I use, it's, it's, it's a science-based 
um, holistic way to deliver whole body personalized care. It's like the short phrase I use for that. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I'm I'm a naturopath, and uh, obviously that means uh, doctor as teacher, naturopathic doctor is doctor as teacher, and naturopath meaning simply the natural way. And for me, natural is consistent with God's design for for a person. And I like to put it this way: the the allopathic practitioner, the traditional medicine practitioner, treats the illness that has the person, and the naturopath or the natural practitioner treats the person that has the illness. And that obviously demands a more holistic approach. What you were just describing: there could be some emotional issues going on, there could be some uh, underlying stress or hidden um, infection that 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 person is not aware of that is seemingly unrelated to their symptoms, but that's the root cause. Yeah, I mean that's that's a very good way to put it. David, you know, you look at, you know, a, a patient sees a cardiologist for a heart attack and they see the psychiatrist for their depression and they see the GI doctor for their IBS. But then the functional medicine practitioner would look say, look, there's a connection between your gut brain heart axis where actually neurotransmitters in your gut affect your brain. Your heart actually affects brain function. There's tons of literature on people developing de- depression after a heart attack. So now all of a sudden the functional medicine person would look at these three things as being interconnected and not just do three different unrelated treatments, but try to find more foundational, you know, um, treatments, you know, Occam's razor, you know, the most simple explanation probably is the calls, like getting more to, to the base of things. It's kind of interesting in medical school, we talk about Occam's razor acutely, you know, if you get one explanation acutely, that's probably the cause of the acute disease. But in functional medicine, we said the exact same thing. We take it more deeper. What are the underlying issues functionally, you know, gut health, nutrition, environment, stress that actually might have set you up for your cardiovascular disease that, you know, it's interesting, you know, that literature shows that cardiovascular disease begins in kids in their teens. They get these little fatty plaques decades before they have the cardiovascular disease, their event in their fifties. So the functional medicine tries to get to that route that far back and, and prevent actually true prevention, true preventive healthcare. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. Before that person is expressing symptoms consistent with what we would label as a disease, there are a lot of things going on biochemically in that, in that person and emotionally and spiritually and addressing them ahead of time. I say one of the best things, best ways to treat cancer is not get it in the first place. Right. So if we adjust our lifestyles ahead of time, we can build health margin into our lives when we're feeling better so that we're better prepared. We're like a shock absorber can handle the bumps in the road. That health margin that we have, which is more health than we actually need to get through our days as a minimum. If we can absorb the health challenges in the form of, a, of an illness or an accident uh, when they when they come away and they're going to come. Right. It's Absolutely. inevitable. It's yeah. part of being human. So how did your approach uh, start to evolve. I know you started out and I'm sure you graduated medical school. It was a traditional medical approach, family practice, and you've evolved over time. So how did the, how did your thinking shift? Tell me that story. Well, I mean, it started, you know, I, you know, I went into primary care. I went to family practice. I want to do everything. I want to be the, you know, I want to be a general contractor, master of all an expert, nothing like you just know how well, everything. Because my goal, one of my goals is actually to be a physician of, like uh, in a mission hospital overseas. And, and we're doing that, you know, I went to a um, hospital and, and um, Ecuador, and it was four family practitioners, a surgeon running a 38 bed hospital in the middle of nowhere. I mean, that was kind of one of my aspirations. So, when I finished my training, my whole thing was learn a new procedure, a new skill set every year. So, I started learning dermatology, doing dermatology procedures after my training, cardiology. I just kept on learning a new thing every year. You know, that was like my underlying mindset. But when we adopted my daughter, and she was actually one of my wife's patients, and she has cerebral palsy, when we first got her, you know, I was, I was not quite happy with the way she was being taken care of. One of her GI doctors said she was underweight and recommended us put a feeding tube, you know, put a hole in her stomach and a plastic tube in there so you could pour. Can I, can I interrupt you right there? How old was she when, when you started this process? Um, We first started with her when she was a year old. Um, I think we took her into our our house when she was about a year and a half to two years old. Okay. So my wife, my wife actually, um, is a pediatric occupational therapist whose specialty was kids with special needs. And when my daughter came out of the hospital at six, when, after six weeks, my wife was her OT. So my wife actually knew her from the time she came out of the, um, the hospital um, as, okay. a, as a therapist. So, um, so you see having that interaction where a GI doctor was like, let's put a tube in her stomach. And my wife, we, we talked about like that would affected her ability to talk. Even though she wasn't ever supposed to talk, she was supposed to be a, basically a vegetable. She was never supposed to walk. We just didn't really accept that, you know? Wow. And so we're like, we don't like this idea of this thing that's actually going to prevent her from learning to walk and talk. Well, fast forward six months, my wife was researching and found a pediatric growth chart for kids with cerebral palsy. And my daughter was right in the middle of it. 
So that was oh, my wow. that was my first that was my first like realization. The experts don't know everything. And so all of a sudden I realized if I want to navigate my daughter, I actually have to learn more about her than the experts know about her. Mm. And that was just like where this whole started. And so I started veering off the path a little bit and a little bit. And the more and more I learned, um, the more I realized, well, there's a whole new world. We st- I started studying genetics and nutritional control of genetic expression. I started looking at lipid medicine, how the fats in your diet affect brain development, environmental toxins, which is a big thing. My, my daughter was exposed to a lot of drugs in, um, while she, in utero and her birth mother. And one of the issues I knew was just trying to get those things out of her system and learn there's actually data on how that affects neurological development in kids with autism, cerebral palsy. So I started researching this and it just took me off the beaten path. And after four or five or six years, you know, I started doing things with her, like seeing patients with complex medical problems and no one else could help with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, autoimmune diseases, patients with cancer who didn't want to recur. And I was like, well, let me start experimenting. That's, that's, the pra- it's called the practice of medicine, right? Yeah. I'm still, I'm still practicing today after 20, 20 odd years, I'm still practicing, you know, and, um, and well, so it's off to you to have the humility to say that. I think that's great. I think one of the things, you know, you know, Socrates in the Phaedo, when he was giving his defense um, in Athens, you know, his whole defense was you claim to know and don't know. And I know that I don't know. Therefore, I'm the only wise one among us. Like that was his whole defense was, I know that I don't know. I'm the fool. Therefore, I'm the only wise one among us because you all think you know and you don't know. And so you know, just realizing <laughs> the infinite complexity of the human being. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about this Bible verse that says, Proclaiming themselves to be wise, they became as fools. Exactly. And while Socrates proclaimed himself to be a fool, and we're still talking about him today, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so it's just one of those things that, um, so just basically and just started learning and realizing that she was way more complex and no one's going to know her as well as my wife or I. So we just kind of, she became our, our, our focus. And so the effect we adopted all of our kids, our second daughter as well has neurological issues. Our son had health issues. And so it just bled into my practice. So I started taking care of complex patients with complex issues and it just changed and evolved. And now with the whole COVID thing, the patients that have been seeing me for years already had their vitamin D levels maximized. We're already taking their B vitamins, all these things we know, you know, 87% of people who die with COVID have low vitamin D levels. Wow. Just imagine if you'd already had your D levels optimized. Before optimized this yeah. beforehand. And, and just as that's what I was saying earlier. If we can, if we can build health margin while we're feeling good, yeah. we're better prepared for the challenge that's going to come our way. I'd like to back up just a minute. I, I know you got some great things yeah. to share, yeah. but I wanted to share this quick story. When you're talking about the feeding tube and, and you found out that it was actually not even necessary down the road, you found that out. Yeah. Um, we have four daughters and uh, number three and four were twins. And I was doing some research when my wife was pregnant and I and I came across some research that supported the idea that too many ultrasounds during pregnancy, probably not great for a developing baby. So we said, yeah, we're going to do it, but we, we'd like to wait a little while. We'll do one early on and then maybe one, you know, mid pregnancy. So we did one around. We did the first one early on. It was everything was normal. We didn't even know it was twins. And then we, we did it uh, later on. And that's when we found out that there was twins, which is quite a story in itself. But anyway, when, when we didn't, when we didn't want to do any more, they said, well, all twins are high risk. We should do an ultrasound every week. I said, no, we're not going to do that. I just don't think that's necessary. So we didn't. My wife gave birth and one baby, one of the twins was more than a pound heavier than the other. And they're identical. And the doctor came to me after the birth and she said, you know, Dave, Good call on the ultrasounds because your wife went full nine months with full term with these babies. If we had known that there was a pound difference, we would have taken these babies out weeks ago. So good call on not doing the ultrasound. So that's just an example of how, you know, the medical profession, I mean, do a lot of good, yeah. but they kind of have a, a, the, the mentality of what can be done will be done. You know, part, you know, a part of that that people don't realize is that OB is like one of the most highly litigious practices in healthcare. And yeah. a lot of things that are happened are, are you know, if, if you do something and there's a mistake or something's messed up, your medical legal liability is much lower. If you don't do anything and something happens, your your medical legal liability is much higher. And, ex- and one, of the, one of the examples in the literature is our, our C-section rate here in the United States. You know, you go to Ireland, you know, there's a lot of Irish people in the United States, right? You know, my wife's wife, sure. her family's got Irish descent there. And the C-section rate in Ireland, and most of the deliveries is done by um, nurse midwives, you know, not in hospitals, is 5%. Yeah. 5%. In the United States, is about 50. 
Oh my and goodness. It's going up. And some places, some countries in the world, like Italy, Brazil has a high, high, high in certain populations. You're looking at close to 80% C section rate. And you gotta ask yourself, well, why is that? When I was in Ecuador at the mission hospital, there was this one lady that came out, it was her ninth baby. And um, she, all eight had been delivered in, in the in the um the jungle. And the reason she came to the hospital and um was about a voice on this, um um in um Shelmeta is where it was at, at in Ecuador. Um if you're familiar actually with Jim Sate, Jim Sate and Jane, um Tim Elliott and I'm sorry, Tim Elliott. Yeah, he's the guy that inspired yeah, yeah, the yeah. the end of the spear yeah, movie. Yeah, this actually this is the hospital. This is where they were at. So this, okay. I was kinda it's kind of that's kind of the it's kind of setting. And um so she came to the hospital because she was bleeding, right? And so I checked her out and like she's four centimeters, she's fine. I'm gonna you know, walk down the hallway, get something to eat, walk out of the hospital the door, and the nurse is trying to talk to me and, and Spanish is like my second language and I'm not hundred percent fluent in it. So I'm like, okay, I'll be back in a few minutes, you know. She wanted me to stay, walk down the hallway, and I hear doctor, doctor. I run out. The lady is standing over on the floor scrunched and the baby's out oh boy she went from four centimeters to out in less than a minute and it was just one of those things it's like wow like and that's normal there that's yeah the, that's the only reason she that was number nine and the only reason she came to the hospital was she was bleeding with number nine not eight or seven <laughs> or six or five or four or three or two you know and just one of those things it's like wow that's pretty i mean it's kind of profound, you know? Yeah. And um, when I, del- I delivered probably 30 babies while I was there and that was a very quick process. It wasn't that long. Even the, even the ba- women who was the first baby, they were, they were laboring maybe 45 minutes or an hour. It was just a totally different experience there. Hmm. And here where you have women that have been second, third baby, they're still spending hours and hours and hours in labor and having C-sections on their second, third baby. So it's just a totally, yeah. totally different experience. Well, one of the things you, I'm sure you know way more about this than I do, but we, we've had four children and I was there for all the births. And when, when a woman is induced, it tends to slow the labor down. Um, also, also, when they give them the, um, the epidural, that will slow labor down as well. Also increases and, C-section incense as well. Yes, Right, right. Because if something happens there, it's not it's not natural. Again, we're going back to the God's design. It's my contention that we we maximize our health potential when we align our lives more fully with God's design for spirit, mind and body. And God has obviously a design for childbirth. And again, the medical profession can do a lot of good, saves a lot of lives, by the way. But we should be careful about intervening uh, and and messing with God's ideal design. That's my contention. So I saw a couple of phrases on your website, and I'd like for you to speak to these for, for a minute. One was, harness your body's power to heal. What does that mean? So you've decided to make some improvements to your health and well-being. You're listening to shows like this where you can get information that can help take your health to the next level. The trouble is, getting educated and implementing effective strategies is time-consuming and can be expensive, not to mention overwhelming. That's why I wrote my book, The Christian's Guide to Holistic Health. In my book, I've taken 20 years of research and experience as a natural and holistic health coach and distilled it down to what you need to know to maximize your health potential in spirit, mind, and body. It's my contention that we maximize our health potential by aligning our lives more fully with God's design for spirit, mind, and body. My book, The Christian's Guide to Holistic Health, will put you on the fast track to the vibrant health and vitality you've been looking for. By the way, many of my recommendations won't cost you a nickel. They're free because a lot of my message is simply aligning our lives more fully with the Word of God. That doesn't cost you a thing. If you'd like to avoid overwhelm and get some biblically-based holistic health information that you can implement right away, go to my website, davidsandstrom.com forward slash book. That's D-A-V-I-D-S-A-N-D-S-T-R-O-M, as in Mike, dot com forward slash book, and you can learn more and pick up a copy today. If that doesn't work, you can go directly to Amazon. It's available there in paperback, Kindle, and Audible. Now let's get back to the show. Harness your body's power to heal. What does that mean? It's really interesting. If you give the body the right nutrition, the right food, the right environment, the right rest, the right sleep, it wants to get better. It's almost like the body wants to heal. It's, it's amazing to me that you can actually feed your body, um, process foods, breathe dirty air, drink dirty water for years and years. It takes, how many years does it take to get lung cancer? 
decades, right? I mean, yeah. It's amazing like what you can do to your body and still it self heals and re- repairs and wants to be healthy. I mean, put, put diesel in your car, your gas car once, put some dirt in there once. How many times does it take that thing to break down? It's so easy for a complex machine to break down, right? Yeah. Yet your body, which is infinitely complex, you know, it has this built-in redundancy, this built-in ability to work around stuff. And so it's, it's amazing to see people with chronic health issues um, as you start to remove you know, inflammatory foods, fix nutritional deficiencies, remove environmental exposures, address their gut, address their sleeping patterns, how quickly people begin to heal. It's almost like they want to heal. You just got to give them the right stuff. I think there's a saying in actually naturopathic medicine, remove the things that don't belong and put in the things that do belong and your body does the rest, right? And it's just yeah. like, that's kind of like, you know, seeing the science behind that, behind the whole gut microbiome, the gut brain connection, realizing that Parkinson's disease starts in your GI tract 20 years before diagnosis. All of a sudden, the gut becomes, if you have any about the neurological issue, the gut becomes one of your primary organs of interest, you know, and, yeah. and then learning how that, that connectivity is, is super um, important, but also there's leverage points, things you can do. And I think that's a important thing. It's, it's hope. There's things you can do for people that will change their health trajectory. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, getting back to that naturopathic approach, I like to tell people this. We, an important concept for, an, for a naturopath is the concept of total body load. And that is we're all dealing with various health challenges. You know, we're, we're breathing toxic air. We have genetically modified food in our diets. You know, there's sleep compromises, stress at work, you name it. Uh, we all have a number of stressors. And when our body starts to get loaded down with too much of that, that's when we start to see symptoms. And that's, you know, when you get comes a point where you're going to have disease, a, a diagnosis. So we build health into our systems by reducing our total body load and getting rid of those things that are hindering our health and adding as many health enhancing factors into our lifestyles as we can. And we tilt the scale in our favor and we're, it's like we're on a seesaw. We want as many health enhancing factors on one side and as few health inhibiting factors on the other. And that's the concept of total body load because we can lean on that God given innate wisdom of the body to heal itself because health is our default setting. If I cut my finger with a kitchen knife, I don't have to tell my blood how to clot. I don't have to tell my cells how to dispatch cholesterol and other proteins to heal the skin that happens automatically so we lean on that god-given wisdom by getting the obstacles out of the way and let our bodies do what they already know how to do and that is to heal and to thrive i think it's also interesting if you look at just the data literature that from the university of florida that half of all chronic disease in our country can be directly attributed to eating processed foods and from the harvard school of public health um walter willett who's like probably the top epidemiologist in the country 80 percent of heart disease and 70% of cancer can be prevented by diet and lifestyle alone. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. That's just, those numbers, it's like, you know, I tell patients like, you're, anything you do is way more powerful than anything I can do for you. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a couple studies when I was researching for my book, Christian's Guide to Holistic Health, is that something like 85 to 90% of all doctor visits can be blamed on stress. So we may not have any control over the genetics we inherit. But we do have control over the level of stress we introduce into our lives. Are we practicing good finances? You know, are we are we forgiving the people that have hurt us? Uh, are, are we building in margin into our drive to work? I mean, you know, if your drive takes 20 minutes to work, do you leave uh, 19 minutes before you have to be there? You know, how about, you know, leaving a little bit earlier and just take some of the stress out of the drive? You know, those types of things will all add up to building in health margin. Absolutely. Yeah. You have a membership at your your clinic, and I know there's an online community and an in-person membership. So talk to me a little bit about, or talk to the listeners about what becoming a patient at your clinic looks like. Well, I mean, you know, I try to leverage people's insurance and their resources as best I can. The problem is, is that this kind of medicine takes time. You know, my intake is like two hours to see somebody. And then it probably takes me 30 to 45 minutes to review their labs. And then when they come back, there's another 45 minute you know, lab review. Well, that, you know, for all that time, insurance, insurance pays me for the first 20 minutes of the intake and the 12 minutes of the follow-up. That's it. So the membership basically is the way I can, it's the way I can, you know, do things appropriately, stay legally safe um, as far as insurance contracts are concerned, which is the big, the big thing. Yeah. And to be able to have, and able to utilize my knowledge base to help my patients, you know, insurance pays for procedures. It doesn't pay for cognitive work. So, you know, I remember I used to be in the hospital and I'd go see someone in the ICU, you know, insurance would pay me $75 for an hour in the ICU and another 45 minutes of feeling nursing 
calls. You know, they 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 wouldn't they just didn't pay for for brain work. They only paid for procedures. And so that the membership kind of covers all that. The online community is my way to get this kind of medicine out to more people. You know, the thing about there's there's less than two thousand practitioners in our country trained like I am. You know, um, in Richmond City proper, there's two double boarded functional practitioners. The other one's in, my, is in, is in the practice with me, Dr. Jensky. Um, in the city, there's maybe two or three other doctors that are functionally trained. And, and our city is like a, a population of 1.5 million. There's just not enough people out there to deliver this kind of care to those those who, who want it. So the community is a way, it's like a physician-led community that has coaching courses and um, and community. So basically the idea is that I'll do a course on, re- actually my first yeah. class is Roadmap to Resilience, where I walk through the foundations of functional medicine then within the community, people share ideas, share thoughts. You know, you know, there's a lot of wisdom in a group. If you have a hundred people and they're combined life age, as you're looking at tens of thousands of hours of life in there, it's like that's a lot of wisdom. And then I have nurse practitioners kind of help with with coaching with questions. And then every month I'll do a live QA. So the idea is like to empower the individual. It's kind of going back to the whole Lord of the Rings thing where you know it's Frodo's responsible. He has the ring of power, he's the one who has to take the power, the ring to the, the mountain of fire, right? And destroy it. But he has a whole team around him and he's got his, his Gimli, he's got his Legolas, he's got his, his Samwise, which was actually probably the hero of the book, to be honest with you. And then he's got Gandalf. And so like, that's, I'm trying to create that team that empowers the individual to take the journey. Well, you know, before we hit record, we were talking a little bit about what the medical community can learn from the aviation community. And one of the things we do as airline pilots is, there's a concept called crew resource management. And that is creating an environment as, especially as a captain, that you want to solicit uh, input from your first officer, from the flight attendants, uh, from the ground personnel, the dispatcher, the mechanics, and all that. And then when you have a challenge, one of the phrases that we use in training is expand your team, get some other people involved. You got a, you got a question regarding a security issue. We have a corporate security department. We can call and talk to them about that. We have supervisors at the station that, that can look up records and, and tell us things about a particular passenger. So expanding the team is a really, really good safety practice when it comes to flying an airliner. And, and I think the same could be said here in health and wellness. So, but, but, but what you said, basically it's that's, I'm trying to mimic kind of almost didn't realize it, but what you're doing in the airline community with putting this team together um, but with the unique advantage of it is anybody anywhere in the country can actually join the community and be a part of it. I've got long haulers, which that's people who get COVID and have symptoms, you know, three months later. I've got long haulers in California and Canada, part of the community. Um, so it's really, really exciting. Do you do that with a Facebook group or how is the how does the online community work? Um, it's basically, I do it through Mighty Networks, which is just a platform set up for that. I don't do um, Facebook just because Facebook can shut you down whenever they want. One of the things I learned with social media, with COVID, is that if someone doesn't, if, they, if one of these platforms doesn't like what you say, they can shut you down. Yeah. So I was actually talking about, one of the, I did a post on pollution and severe COVID because there's literature out there that air quality increases your risk for severe COVID disease. And I was looking sure. at, I was, Makes sense. I was using an article from the British Medical Journal, right? I mean, that's a reputable, you know, journal. Sure. I was censored for political speech. Wow. Because, because pollution was, and, and the algorithms for Facebook was considered political speech. And just, I realized, and I started changing my verbiage a little bit, if I used a World Health, a WHO article as a link, there's a CDC article, I have thousands and thousands and thousands of views. If I used New England Journal of Medicine and JAMA, I'd have a couple hundred views. Wow. And so, and so based on what I was using for my sources determined how, you know, legitimate or trustworthy my stuff was. I just realized I need to, I need to control the platform to a certain degree. And yeah. so I just kind of pulled out of that with this. Cause I, I can't, I don't, I'm not gonna go all this work and have someone say, I'm, you know, crazy talk. You might, you can, you can help heal your body. That's, you know, that's not the FDA approved. We're going we're to shut it down. So, um, <laughs> yeah. so. Good for you. I, I think that's great to have that kind of independence because you know, there's people building businesses on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram. That could be shut down overnight. You had you don't have any control over that, which is yeah. difficult. Yeah, one of the new things on online businesses that happened with all the COVID, so people are realizing you have to own your information stream. And so whether like the the if the basis is your website, you need to own your website. If the you need to have your resources on Instagram, that might be there or Facebook, you need to have them also sitting on your website because there's no guarantee those things will continue to let your stuff be out there. And, and now the, the the Facebook and Instagram are more pay to play. So now, unless I pay, you, know, people, you might follow me on Facebook and unless I pay money, you won't see it when I'm doing no post. Wow. So just like as that whole system's changing, people are realizing you actually have to have control of whatever information you're putting out there. So you have to either have your own website or your own platform or something like that. So that, um, you know, you can say, here, find me here and people will come and find you, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, excellent. That's really good. So I want to go back to what we talked about just a minute. You mentioned the, the COVID long haulers. Now, it would be my contention that a COVID long hauler, someone who still has symptoms four, five, six months down the road, they probably have a higher total body load. So when you're working with especially those patients, people with a COVID long hauler, what are the, some of the common uh, underlying issues that you're seeing with those people? Well, I'm going to preempt that question real quick. It's the idea of a post-infectious inflammation. You get a viral infection and you have chronic issues is an old, old idea. We saw it in the late 1880s with the Russian flu. We saw it with the long flu of 1919, 1920. We've seen it with Lyme. You get a tick bite and you get chronic Lyme disease. These are all post-infectious inflammatory syndromes. And so one of the things on long haulers is I have the, as a functional medicine doctor, I have the advantage of having all these, this old armamentarium that I'm now applying to these patients. And so one of the things I'm seeing is, you know, hey, patients who live in moldy buildings, it's, it's to date, I'm um, 80% of my long haulers either worked in or lived in a, a moldy environment. Um, is that right? Yeah, um, hypermobility. You know, one out of 30 Americans is hypermobile, has this thing called hypermobility spectrum disorder, being double jointed. Well, that increases your your risk for inflammation and also increases your your risk for gut issues and, mal- and nutrient deficiencies. You know, very you know, interesting. Nutritional status, you know, if your vitamin D is low, it's really interesting. But vitamin D does so many amazing things. But there's two arms of your immune system. There's the the old type, which is very um, the archaic type that can attack viruses and cancer. And then there's the adaptive part that makes antibodies. You always use that innate part first of your immune system, and you you switch over to the adapted or the antibody part of your immune system. Well, that handoff requires vitamin D. So if your D levels are low and you get a viral infection, it's hard to transition to make antibodies, and it's also hard for that innate system to turn off. So all of a sudden, there's a whole host of nutrients that can help that whole process, and so because I already knew about these things and other post-infectious or other auto-inflammatory syndromes where your body it becomes an inflammation against itself, not quite autoimmune diseases, but similar concept, I was, I'm able to apply those to long COVID. And a great example of that is low-dose naltrexone. You, you may have heard of low-dose naltrexone before. It's been around for decades. It's been, there's literature on using it for multiple sclerosis, um, using it for POTS and dysautonomia, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. Well, guess what? There's data now with COVID and long COVID. You know, COVID-induced dysautonomia and POTS, COVID-induced chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. So I started using naltrexone with my patients. And lo and behold, now there's research to support naltrexone actually can help these people with long COVID. And there's actually now a pharmaceutical company researching a proprietary form of naltrexone to treat long COVID. And it's interesting how like that, like that was already in my armamentarium. I just have to repurpose these tools. And that's, those are some of the things. I was doing some research the other day and tell me if you agree with this, but does this doc was saying that, um, if you have super high level, you've optimized your vitamin D and even gone above the recommended levels. He's, I know that they say maybe the naturopathic optimum is about 60. Uh, I think it's, what is it? Milliliters per deciliter. Is that the way it's yeah, measured? Um, I think it's milli, milli, um, nanograms per deciliter. Nanograms think, per deciliter. Yeah. But, but, but 60 to 80 is the um 60 to 80 is considered yeah. optimum. This guy was saying go to 100 or more because with a lot of vitamin D, you decrease the uh, need to engage the immune system. So when the immune system is engaged, that's pro-inflammatory. So if you can reduce the the reaction out of the immune system by having adequate D, you have less systemic inflammation. Does that make sense? Well, it does, but there's, but there's an interesting twist to that, you know, David, like, you know, the whole idea of holistic, which, you know, I, I like to use the word when I like to use it, and I don't like to use it, when I don't like to use it, but, um, but <laughs> I'm with you. Yeah, but um, I get but, it. But like in, 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 um, in indigenous um, cultures in Africa, where kids, kids are running around outside all day long, you know, crazy potent sun with not a whole lot of clothing. They'll have blood levels of vitamin D between two and 300. Wow. Okay. So that's, you know, that's interesting fact. So the question becomes, is our normal range of 30 to 100? Obviously, hmm. the low end of normal is not 30. It's probably closer to just 60 because, it's you know, maybe the high end is not 100. Maybe it's 150 or 200, you know? So if I, have some, if I have someone who who has an autoimmune issue, who's really sick. I'll, I'll push it just because I have to also remember behind, between, behind every patient is a, is a um, malpractice lawyer. <laughs> so I have to like be careful. It's a shame um, that that's true, but it's, it's a shame. There, yes, right? it is. But it's, you look, I learned that in medical school in 1996. Wow. That was, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but so I'll push somebody closer to hundred and check their calcium levels, you know, make sure I'm not pushing that up. Yeah. Um, but the reality is, is that I've had patients who've taken it, come back with levels of 130, 150, I've checked their calcium, checked their stuff, and they were fine. You know, so I try to, I try to, if someone's really sick, I'll push it closer to that 100 level, like you said. Um, but using some of that innate 
wisdom from other places around the world. You know, that's part of the translational medicine, part of functional medicine. It's like, why can't I use data from Africa and South Korea and Germany and China and Japan? Why do I have to only use stuff that the FDA says I can use, you know? Yeah. And that's where, and I think COVID's actually accelerated this because people want to know what's going on around the world. They want to know what's going on in the UK, which is actually leaps ahead of everybody in the world right now, as far as tracking COVID, controlling COVID and, and producing data you know, on why can't I look at their the Irish data on vitamin D in Ireland? They produced a whole book last summer on D usage in Ireland. Is that right? And had all, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was national, their national health system. And it was like D, UD should be 60, 80. Kids should be taking one to 2,000 units a day. It was like all these things, that, you know, practitioners like me have been saying in the United States. It's just the Fed, the government in Ireland was saying the exact same thing. Yeah. So. Well, our, our government is obviously, uh, you know, slow to move, slow to change. And, uh, you know, slow to embrace new ideas when, when that's where, you know, a practitioner like yourself can look at the research and start using that right away. And, you know, you don't have to wait for the government to tell you or give you permission. Yeah. I think that's one of the things people don't realize when you talk about standard of care. In my mind, standard of care, it's the lowest hanging fruit. It's the lowest common denominator. Like standard of care is what we all, that's the least quality care we all should do. When you realize the standard of care, it's like you get a room of doctors or a room of cardiologists We'll decide what's what's the optimal blood pressure control and medications and what can we all agree on? And that becomes the new standard of care for blood pressure control. It's not anything cutting edge. It's just what a whole group of people can agree on. I mean, get a group of your favorite, you know, naturopath people together, or whatever. What can we all agree on? Right. Yeah. And the answer is you only, you're going to agree on what you don't disagree on. <laughs> and <laughs> right. By definition. So all of a sudden it's like, well, how about cutting edge stuff? We can't agree on that. Yeah. You know, what about, what about, you know, using medicinal herbs, using hericlium, lion's mane? No, we can't agree on that. So I don't, you know, and all of a sudden it's like, okay, all right. So vaccine, we can all agree. Okay. You know, maybe, we don't, maybe we don't agree on that too. Right. But that's the point. It's like, <laughs> depends on who you're talking to. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. So um, what's funny. Cause like I'm a clinical researcher with Pfizer. Like my research site is the sixth biggest in the country for the pediatric vaccine for Pfizer. So, you know, I've kind of got my foot in the research world. Um, I've done over 60 clinical studies and I've published in Lancet. I've got my, my foot in primary care world, the functional world. I'm, I'm leveraging all these patients, these things for my patients. Uh-huh. You know? So talk to me about the vaccine. Uh, what's that research been telling you? Yeah, I could talk for hours about that. You have more specific questions. <laughs> yeah, we have to kind of wrap things up here in a <laughs> yeah. little bit. But uh, yeah. well, I know there's an mRNA vaccine yeah. and then there's a more traditional uh, inactive viral vaccine. Yeah. That's the that's the J&J one, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Is that correct? correct? Yeah. So. Could you talk a little bit about the differences and share with the natural nation what you've been seeing with your research? Well, the the the, um, the difference is the delivery system, but the end product is the same. So with the Moderna and the Pfizer, they're using an mRNA. That's an uh, the delivery system is is a is a nanoparticle, a lipid nanoparticle that's based on phosphatidylcholine, which is I use that all the time in my clinic. So they put the mRNA in there versus the J and J is using a adenovirus capsule and putting DNA in there. Okay. And so what happens is you have these two different arms come in. The mRNA goes right to ribosomes. Ribosomes make pr- the, pro- the spike protein right. that your body has an immune response to. Yep. So the, the mRNA cannot turn to RNA. It doesn't turn on DNA, right? The DNA is going in, being transcribed to RNA, to mRNA, to go to the ribosomes. And once it gets to that stage, it makes a spike protein. So once, you know, it's, it's, once it gets to the point of the ribosomes making the the spike protein from there on, it's the same process. It's just, how do you get it there? Okay. You know, what's your delivery mechanism? Is it, is it a, a capsid, a viral capsid, you know, which actually, you know, it's, it's actually kind of a unique, it's actually a different, unique delivery system. You know, you're still using molecular, you're still using a nuclear nucleic acid DNA versus MRNA. Um, we don't have any other DNA vaccines to date. You're just using the adenovirus as a delivery system. It's actually, these are both very elegant systems. You know, I was um, actually emailed the, um, the president of Pfizer, like, because my question is, is how, how long is it going to take for us to make new vaccines? And we're actually starting actually today, the variant vaccine study with the South African variant of um, COVID-19. And the answer was we can turn out a, vac- a new vaccine to a new thing now in a hundred days. Wow. This might change how we do all vaccines going forward, that you can literally make a new vaccine in a hundred days. You know, there's a lot of unknowns, but that's, that could be a game changer. So the process is very, very different. The technology they're using is very, very different than the traditional vaccine manufacturing process. Mm-hmm. So what would you say to the person, the critic that says, well, these actually aren't vaccines. It's experimental gene therapy because it is gene therapy, right? So what would you say to that? 
Well, the thing is, that's, I think it's a misunderstanding. Like your, your DNA makes RNA, RNA makes mRNA, mRNA goes to ribosomes, makes protein. Yes. People are conflating that with mRNA going into your DNA and changing who you are, but it doesn't work. You can't, I can't take a protein and change your DNA. I can't change a ribosome and change your DNA. I can't take an mRNA and change your DNA. If I have an RNA with a reverse transcriptase like hepatitis B, like um, HIV, then I can insert that into your DNA. But you need a reverse transcriptase, which is really the reason why with the Pfizer vaccine, we wanted to get people in the study with HIV to see how this would affect those people who already have a virus in their body that has a reverse transcriptase that can actually put in nuclear material into the DNA. And a lot of people don't realize that there are, there are three different vehicles that Pfizer was looking at. Pfizer was looking at a self-replicating protein called like almost like a prion there. And they were looking at two other, uh, two other vehicles and they chose this one, which I was actually happy about, which was the least risky per se. You know, the MRNA in your body hangs around for 48 hours, 24 to 48 hours. They have these little cells called lysosomes that break them down really, really quickly. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a regular traditional vaccine, it uses aluminum as an adjuvant. Yes. The literature is the aluminum can stay in your body for years sometimes. Right. You know, this, I, I, I like to, I got, I just finished reading this book, Um, you know, about six months ago. I don't know if you read it. Vaccines, vaccines and autoimmunology. Yeah. And so basically and it's written by Dr. Schoenfeld, who's like the head, one of the head immunologists in the world at the University of Tel Aviv. And we've known for decades that the adjuvants, the things that irritate your immune system, whether it's, you know, aluminum, or different um, Froon's adjuvant, which is an oral-based adjuvant, those can linger in your body and cause autoimmunity. The beauty with this new technology is the adjuvant is the mRNA, and it's gone in 48 hours. So that risk for immune overactivation should be much less than this vaccine. I say should be because we won't know for years because that's right. just how science works. Yeah, even with any traditional FDA-approved drug, they, they follow that for years after the approval process just to see how it's going. Absolutely. That's called phase four studies. You just keep on watching it. You have this thing called um, IVRS where people look and they put in vaccine or whatever side effects. And we learn that's, you know, drugs get pulled from the market for a reason. Right. Interesting. Good, good stuff. Good stuff there. So if someone wants to get a hold of you, how can a listener get a hold of you? They can just go to my website, um, richmondfunctionalmedicine.com. Um, that's my, that's my, my main launching place okay. for social media. Um, hopefully we'll get back doing the blog. I mean, I mean, I'm sorry, the podcast, um, the blog stuff, social media stuff are there. And you can then, then from there, go to Instagram. My um, community access is there as well as my in-person, um, membership is all from Richmond functional medicine .com. All right. And what's the name of your podcast? Foundations of Functional Medicine. Um, I've done like four or five episodes. So my goal is once we, my life calms down a little bit to um, at least finish the foundations, which are diet, lifestyle, stress, relationships, sleep. So Yeah. So you you took a pause from the podcasting right now. I took a pause and got sucked into the whole COVID uh, social media world with all the stuff I'm doing right well, now with that. So. I can imagine being who you are and what, what your training entails uh, that you're going to be, you're probably a pretty busy guy over the last year. Yes, I have been. Yeah. You didn't have to go look for people. I'm sure people were looking for you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, my office, we never closed through the whole pandemic. We were open. Good for you. Our primary, our primary care office is open seven days a week. And so when this all happened, you know, as a business owner, as some, it's, just, it's like, it's if you're a firefighter and someone says, look, the building's on fire. You don't go, ah, fire. I'm kind of scared to call me back when it's smoking, right? It's they like, run okay, in. yes, yeah. you know, it's, you gotta be a little crazy. Yep. To run into a building, building, but it's like what's what you train for, you yeah. know. It's like when something there's a crime, you call a police officer. Where they they go to the to the scene of the crime. It's like I'm going the other way, you know. And so when this all happened, I was like, you know, I've been talking to my wife about this ever since we met. It's like you train for this kind of stuff, and we need to be here for our patients to keep them out of the hospital, to keep them safe as best we can. And so I felt as I'm on moral obligation. I had to, as a, and I'm the president of our of our clinic. We have ten practitioners, and we see like over 200 patients a day through our office. And so I was like, we need to stay open. Mm -hmm. And so we did that um this whole time you know my, my job was to serve and so this was like this might be my only opportunity it's, this is never hopefully it's never happened again in my career and it's like and it's just like you know it's game die yeah, yeah people were scared we wore a mask we did all kinds of stuff in our office people weighed in their cars we had to, we had to develop a whole system to take care of patients uh -huh. but we we did it because we felt like it was our duty Good for you hats off to that love it all right dr harman unless there's something else you want to share i uh, appreciate your time today I, just, I mean, I, David, I just want to thank you again for inviting me on. Just encourage your listeners just to take take hold of their care. You know, I think we're, we were made, we're designed for health. If you're not optimizing your health, just figure out what those things that set you up for illness, triggered it, things that are keeping you there. And if you move those, your body's made amazingly and 
it tends to want to heal itself. You know? Totally agree. All right. Thanks again. Take care. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Aaron Hartman. He is not only a very knowledgeable medical doctor, but he's firmly planted in the functional medicine world, or some would call it the natural and holistic world. And he's also a very loving, compassionate human being. What a pleasure it was to meet him. For more, go to davidsandstrom.com. In the show notes for each episode, you'll find links to all the resources that were mentioned, as well as a full transcript with timestamps that you can download for free. In addition, I always include a content upgrade with each show, which is a free download that is designed to help you go deeper with that subject. Once again, thank you for listening, and I'll talk with you next week. Be blessed. Thank you.